uh, October is Hospitality Month, um, which is a really exciting time. We host loads of different events. Lots of people have kind of volunteered um, to host all these different things going on. Um, and what you can do is those are all now available. Um, so you'll see over on uh, that side of the church, there's lots of pieces of paper up on the wall and lots of slips in front of them. You can have a read about the events that are happening. And then on the table adjacent, you'll find the piece of paper for that event. So anyone can sign up to anything. There's no limits. There's no um, requirements. We just love you to come to an event that you're interested in uh, and come along and be part of that. Um, if you need any more information, if there's any confusion, do please speak to me or to Annabelle, who will be um, somewhere around the table. But we'd, we'd really encourage everyone just to, even if it's one thing, to, to sign up and be part of that. Um, and I'm going to invite up Phoebe and, oh, James instead. That's fine. And I think uh, Candy is going to be coming up as well. She's there. Great. Both come up and they're going to share about an event that's happening today as well as some stuff happening with WebNet. Um, hello, uh, I have had to step in for Phoebe last minute, um, so I apologise. Um, but uh, Carl has asked me to make you aware of the Chinese painting that will be happening uh, over there from two to four. Um, these are just some examples of... Um, Yes, thank you so much. Um, these are some examples of uh, what you could be painting later on. Um, so please come along. Um, the sign-up is now closed for it, um, but if you're there, that's just the details. And um, please remember uh, a white plate and newspaper as well. Um, so just to make you aware of that, and hope to see you there. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Candy. I'm a Hong Kong minister and work for West of England Baptist Life Work. Um, it's my privilege. I can share here. Um, my main job is help some Hong Kong people integrate into the local congregations and then um, try to walk along with them and then also cultivate. So, if you meet or encounter some Hong Kong people in your community, in your workplace, please let me know. It's okay. Great, wonderful, good boy, a good girl. <laughs> yeah. If you have any inquiries or any, anything about uh, Hong Kong people or how to integrate here, how to adapt here, how to face the hurdles here, please let me know. And how to catch me? Up, and you can call me, or not call me, sorry. You just can reach me by email. My email address is candy.choi. Choi is my surname, C-H-O-Y. C-H-O-Y, do you know? Um, Pat Choi? Yeah, great. You can find it in Audi or Tesco. But <laughs> here, brought me just one, one Pat Choi here. Candy.choi at webnetwork. .org.uk. If you cannot remember, it's fine. You also can find my buddy here, Carol. Will you stand up? Yeah. If you have any concerns or issues about the Hong Kong people, you can find me, you can reach me, or I'll reach um, Carol. That's fine. Just to um, bless you all and then peace and grace to you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was such a fun notice. I love that. Um, that was brilliant. Um, another thing to flag up that is happening this week. Uh, normally, every Tuesday, we gather across the city in various homes for home groups. Uh, but this week, instead, because it is the first Tuesday of the month, we will be gathering together in this building, uh, probably in one of the upstairs rooms, which is just across the way, uh, for a prayer meeting. Uh, so everyone is really welcome to that, uh, whether you just kind of recently joined us, whether you've been coming for ages. We'd really, really encourage you. Uh, Mark, our pastor, sent around a message this week, and he said, you know, it's, it's a highlight of the week, really. It's a great time. It really blesses is those who come to pray for one another, be prayed for, pray for our city, hear about what's going on, and just spend an hour on a Tuesday lifting up um, things to the Lord, because we know the Lord listens, and he hears, and he delights to answer our prayer. So we'd love to see loads of people here on Tuesday. Um, here at Broadmead, we have been um, doing uh, a Bible in two years. Um, so we're, we're reading sections of the Old Testament and sections of the New Testament each day, and we're following various series to, to help us all understand better what God is saying to us through his word. And today we're right at the end of the Bible, we're um, finishing our short series in Revelation. So as we start this morning, I thought um, they're just wonderful words, we're going to hear them read later as well. Um, but let's, let's start um, and read the start of Revelation 21. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Um, For those of us who are following Jesus, we have wonderful, wonderful hope um, in the new creation. Um, This place where God promises that he will dwell with us, that we will be with him. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And and he is making everything new. What a hope to fix our eyes on. Um, So we are going to sing this morning. I'll invite the the band up. And and the first song we're going to sing, There Is One Gospel. It speaks of God's eternal plan throughout all generations, all eternity, to bring his people to himself. And um, yeah, if we are those here this morning trusting in Jesus, this this is our hope too. Um, So I'd invite you to stand as we sing together now that there is one gospel. Jesus Christ. 
Jesus, we praise you that we have your wonderful gospel to stand on. We praise you that you are the king of life, um, that we, we aren't alone because of you, um, and that we have that wonderful day in glory to look forward to, where we will sing of you who has rescued us, Lord. We thank you and praise you for that. Amen. Amen. Uh, do please take your seats. We have one more announcement this morning um, before uh, we head on to our baptism, so I'm going to invite... Lucy up, she's there, um, to tell us a bit about the publicity team. Hello, um, nice to see everyone. I'm Lucy, if you don't know me, and I'm part of the publicity team that we have here at Broadmead. Um, and we would love someone new to join us to help us with updating the church website. Um, so we just update it every week with the Bible readings for that week while we're doing the Bible in two years plan. Um, so yeah, they just need to go on the website. Now you might be thinking, oh, I don't know how to build a website. I'm not like a computer expert. Totally fine. Um, because the website's already built. So all you need to do is basically go on there, edit the text and then press done. And that's it. Um, so if you're interested in helping out, then please come and chat to me today or anytime, and that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. I'm now going to hand over to John um, for the baptism. Thanks so much, Ellie. Um, I'm John, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'd love to invite Dan up. Um, today's a really special day because today's the day in which we're, we're welcoming Dan into the church family. Um, He's getting baptised. Um, and I'm going to explain a bit more about what baptism is, but first, it'd be great to hear Dan's story. So, Dan, tell us your story. Sweet. Thanks, John. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here this morning. Um, particularly some friends who've come from a long way away. So, yeah, nice to see you all as well. Um, so about me. So I was born into a Christian family. Um, I grew up attending church every week. Um, I got involved with the church as a teenager, um, playing the guitar, doing the tech team, doing some of the youth groups. Um, I attended a lot of Christian camps throughout my childhood, um, so such as my church with a youth group, we had a thing called Discovery Camp, um, went to Contagious, which some people here will know, um, and some of the Scripture Union sailing holidays that I do as well. Um, like I said, he's my representative today. Um, yeah, Kestrels and Harris, they're called. Throughout all these camps, I can recall kind of multiple times where um, I'd be on the camp and just have a, a really great buzz about things and wanting to commit my life to Jesus, but then kind of within about a month of leaving the camp, um, that feeling had kind of gone, and that was kind of the story throughout most of my teenage years. I kind of go up and down, up and down almost every year. Um, as I got into kind of towards my later teenage years, um, started enjoying things that would take me further from God, and to the point when I went to university in Southampton, um, I kind of thought, okay, this is my chance to leave church and do whatever I want to do. That didn't last very long. <laughs> Within about a month, I found myself wanting to go back to church, um, and I settled at a church called Above Bar. Um, I was still quite intermittent with going in the first year, but um, second year kind of got in a good routine and got going. Um, I got involved in a home group there, which was really useful and began to build a picture of what my faith might look like. Unfortunately, COVID then interrupted that year. Um, and whilst my church university and my, my home church, my parents' church, um, had lots of good online support with Zoom and YouTube and things, um, I felt quite distant from it. I found it quite hard to relate to it. Um, it didn't mean when we were able to go back to church in person, I realized how much I valued the church family and the community that comes with that. Um, so after university, I was then back home living with my parents, uh, regularly going to church, um, involved with the music and tech teams again. Um, but my faith never really felt like my own. It kind of just felt like I was going out of routine, um, like I'd done for most of my life. Um, the church I was at, Hook Church, um, it's a very loving and supportive church, um, but I think I just needed something new. And after not long after thinking that really, um, I found out I got a job at Dyson and I was going to be moving across over here to Bristol. Um, and then after a few months, I was invited along to Broadmead over here and I just instantly felt at home. Um, over the last year and a half, I got involved in a home group, which has really kind of developed great connections, both with the people in that home group, but also my walk with God. Um, and earlier this year, I felt encouraged to attend Alpha and that really helped to answer some of the questions I had or lingering doubts that I'd had yeah, for, since my teenage years. Um, you know, is God real? 
why does he make rules that just don't seem to make sense? Um, how do I know it's even for me? Um, alongside this, I'm going to embarrass him, but I was meeting with my home group leader, Clark. Um, we'd meet up sort of every week or every couple of weeks, and I mean, poor Clark, it was basically just me throwing questions at him and going, this doesn't make sense, what's going on, why is this? Um, but he was very patient and, yeah, really helped me through that and helped my growth there. I was starting to know that God was there, but it still wasn't quite in my heart. Um, I felt like I could only truly be a Christian once I kind of earned my way there. Um, you know, once I'd stopped doing this thing or once I started doing this other thing. I was challenged, what's at Alpha? Um, as a question asked of me, it was something along the lines of, do you think you're better or worse than anyone else? Um, do you think God's power and forgiveness only works for other people? And that, that really hit me. And the pieces started to come together that it's not anything that I can do, but things that um, Jesus has done for me. I was starting to feel like it was something for me. Um, and it's not just something that my parents were encouraging me to do. Throughout a lot of this time, uh, I was then having some relationship difficulties. I've been with that partner for almost six years. Um, but as my faith grew, we found there were problems with how I wanted the relationship to be and what the future was going to look like. Um, and it was one of the things that, um, yeah, well, it was the kind of the trigger really amongst other things that resulted in a breakup, which was really tricky um, because I felt like I kind of made a jump in the deep end committing what I wanted to this new faith um, and losing a strong relationship that had been just such a big part of my life. Um, just over a week after that breakup, I was then made redundant from Dyson after about two years there, along with lots of other people. Um, and so that was a really tricky week and a really tricky time to navigate. Um, I had incredible support around me from family and friends, most of whom are all here today. Um, and but in that time, I just felt like I heard God saying, just trust me. Um, when I was driving home on the day we were made redundant, um, I just said out loud in the car, um, like, I'm God, I'm not sure what the plan is here, but I hope it's a good one. Um, it's felt like God pushing me towards him and, and, yeah, just telling me to trust him, and that's when things really started to kind of sink in. Um, obviously, it wasn't easy. It came with a lot of anxiety about the future, with relationships, what work I'd be doing, and things like that. But I knew God was there, and it just brought so much more peace to me, um, knowing he's got a plan for me. Um, yeah, not easy, but he's placed so many wonderful and caring people around me to get through that. And yeah, it was after, after that really I could really like kind of strongly feel my connection with God. Um, I didn't always understand what was going on or why he'd done things, um, but I found it easier to trust that he had a plan in place. And looking back, I've seen that plan in action, um, such as when I was trying to find a new job, so when I eventually got the Dyson job, and it took me over um, to a new city over here in Bristol. Um, in Bristol, I had God have provided contacts for me who could help keep a roof over my head while I found the right place to live. Eventually, I found the right place to live and had some really great friends close by. And even when I wanted to move elsewhere and it didn't work out, I can see, actually, in hindsight, what he was planning with that. Um, I've seen God in the friendships I have and the people I associate with. Um, I see it with the work Christian surfers do and how they welcome me into their family and all the work they do with their community. Um, with the devotion of the sailing camps that I do and how they've been such a constant family for me for the last 10 years. Um, and at my parents' church and here at Broadmead with just continual prayer and support that's been given to me. Um, and lastly, I, I see God in creation. Um, I feel his presence particularly in nature when seeing like colors of a sunset or when a wave crashes over my head. Um, I feel like when the power of the wind takes hold of the sails or just looking at every human and creature and animal and just how complex it's all been designed. Now I've got this connection with God, it's really started to change the way I outlook on life. Um, I often like to try and plan things by myself and stand on my own two feet, but I'm trying now to um, commit plans to God, um, which is much greater foundation than I could ever do. Um, I often measure myself on how good my performance has been, so if it's gone well, then I'll be happy. If it's gone badly, then I'll be in a really bad mood. Um, and particularly in a spiritual sense as well, like if I mess up kind of in that way, then I just feel like I'm not good enough for God. And... Well, the truth is, I know I'm not good enough, but I know Jesus died to take that away from me. Um, it means now my identity is in Christ, and that doesn't change. So I know I'm worthy of his love and love from others, no matter how well I do, whether I'm at work, and playing guitar, football pitch, or even when I'm working on a boat in Papua New Guinea. My identity is in God. And that's why I'm being baptized. Um, it's the start of a new chapter for me, both outwardly with things that happened and things that are going to come, um, but how I identify within myself and to others. I intend to do my best to act in the way that Jesus would act, um, but I know that when I fail, I'm still loved unconditionally. He's the basis for my life going forward, and I'm excited to see what plans he has for me.
Uh, thank you so much. That's such an encouragement to hear that story. And um, we've been massively blessed by seeing the change in your life and seeing how God's brought you through, particularly this difficult last kind of time. Um, we'd like to give you this book, Enjoying God, and this verse. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Thank you. Um, and in a moment, we're going to baptise Dan, which, um, for those of you who haven't done this before, haven't seen this before, it basically involves taking him and plunging him underwater. Okay? Um, so... He's going to be completely under. And there's nothing special about the water. It's not kind of this mystical substance. Um, And it's not like a magic ritual. But something very powerful is happening when we do that. Because Dan is publicly saying yes to what God has done in his life. What he is doing in his life and what he will do in his life in the future. And he's publicly saying that he wants to join in with what's going on with Christ and Christ's work in the church. He's saying that very publicly, as, as you just heard, but also the church, we together, are publicly saying yes to what God has done in his life. We're excited at the change we've seen in Dan, and we want to say, yeah, this isn't just in your head, Dan, actually. Um, something's happened here. Um, something exciting um, is going on. And we do that as a local church, but we also do it representing the global church, We're part of this community that spans the earth and goes back thousands of years. And what we're doing is saying something has happened here in Dan's life. He's become a new creation. And what we're doing is publicly testifying to that. We're saying yes. And there's spiritual power in that. So we're all just saying yes to what God's done, basically, and and turning to, to him. Why don't we just do a handshake? Why are we dipping him in water? What's the point of that? Um, Well, it's a powerful enactment of what has happened and of what we're saying yes to. It's about being united with Christ. Jesus Christ died. And as we put Dan under the water, it's a picture of burial, of death. And, And Dan is saying, I identify with Jesus who died. And as we pull him up, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We are here because we are convinced that that is true. We know it's true. And Dan, as he comes up, is saying, identify with Jesus Christ in his resurrection. And it also symbolizes Dan's change. It's not just that Jesus died and Jesus rose again, but also that Dan, in a sense, has died. In being baptized, he's saying, I turn away from an old way of life, a way of being that didn't acknowledge God, that didn't have him as Lord. That part of him is dying under the water. And there's also new life in Dan. As he gets pulled out of the water, it's an image of resurrection, of new hope, of this new start that he's been talking about. That's what it's about. It's death and resurrection. But it's also an image of washing. So this image of washing of sins, of being cleansed and purified because of what Jesus has done. It's a picture of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's going to be completely underwater. He's going to have water all around him. He's going to be drenched. That's what what it's like to be a Christian, is to be filled with God, drenched with the Holy Spirit. And it's also uh, an image of creation, new creation. In creation, God divided the waters. And Dan will be kind of passing through the waters. He, He is a new creation. And finally, Christ, he was baptized himself. He took this step, and we do this in obedience to him. So Dan is saying yes to what God has done. We are saying yes to what God has done, and we're doing that with this powerful image. But water is also an image of trials. We say, don't we, you know, I'm struggling to keep my head above the water. You know, it's an image of hard times. And Dan has been going through a hard time recently, and there will be hard times to come. It's not, everything is not going to be a bed of roses now. And... There'll be times, Dan, where you'll look back and you'll be thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> this is hard, because the Christian life is hard. And actually, this is a moment that you can look back on and say, actually, yes, it's hard now, but I knew it would be hard, and Jesus Christ did something for me, and he's doing something for me now. And that was something that I knew, and it's something that we knew as a representative of the church, the global church. Uh, and so it's something you can hold on to and... Um, and that will encourage you through that, to hold on to Christ uh, through those hard times. Okay, so what's going to happen now is, um, you'll have noticed maybe there are some kids up there. 
If you're a child and you want to get a good view of this, because it is worth watching, then this now is an opportunity to scamper up to the balcony. Um, not too fast, actually. Scampering implies dangerously running. Be safe. Um, maybe go with your parents. Uh, but if you go to the balcony, you'll get a better view. And what's going to happen is um, Dan and I and Jay are going to go into the water. Um, and then I'm going to um, ask Dan some questions, and then we're going to baptize him. The stream of kids is still going up, so talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? I do. Do you turn from sin, renounce evil, and commit to follow Christ? I do. Will you live within the fellowship of the church, and will you serve Jesus Christ in the world? I will. I baptise you in the name of the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. Dry ourselves off now through there, and um, the service is going to continue. Um, we will be back in uh, once, we're, once we're dry. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to sing now a uh, song of worship to God. Do you please stand? Um, and yeah, let's sing and um, yeah, celebrate and praise. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. How great.
This is the time in our service where our children and young people head out to their groups. So there's a few different things happening today. So uh, Connect are going to stay in the service with us, um, which is great. And then at the end of the sermon, they'll kind of go out to their usual um, room that they do for their kind of Q&A to, to talk about the sermon. So uh, do please stay with us, Connect. It's great to have you with us. Our other children um, and young people, so our youngest groups, we have a, a creche and then sparklers um, for the sort of twos, threes and fours before school age um, out this side um, through, it looks like a fire exit, but it's not. There's some really lovely kids rooms that um, lie just behind those doors. Um, and then our school age children um, will be uh, upstairs um, through into those rooms. If you are new and you have uh, young people with you, you are more than welcome for them to join in our groups, um, whatever age they're at. Um, yeah, we'd really uh, love to have them with us. So do kind of uh, follow the crowd who are going out in various different ways. Um, I'll just pray for our, our children and young people as they're leaving us now. Our Father God, we thank you so much um, that we are, are one family, Lord. We thank you that, um, yeah, however old or young we are, uh, that we can know you, God. We thank you that um, from the moment each of us was born, that you have known us and loved us. And we pray for our children now, help them to have a great time in their groups, and we pray that they will know more of Jesus um, in each of their sessions, Lord, and we pray for their safety, um, and we pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Great. I'm now going to invite uh, Olive, who is going to come and pray for us and lead us in a time of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship and to praise you. 
We thank you for your grace and love over the past week, and we thank you for your protection and guidance in our family, at our workplace, and at school. Father, please forgive us if we have been disobedient and not following your way. Lord, help us to be quick to repent and return to you. We pray that through the two-year Bible reading plan, we will be more connected to you and know you deeper, that we will be able to persevere and endure in times of this chaotic period until your return. We pray for Broadmead. We thank you for this church and pray that Broadmead can be a resting place for people searching for God and for people feeling despair and lonely. We pray for Mark, John, elders and all the leaders that Father, please provide with them the strength and wisdom they need to continue to serve. Lord, we praise you for the beautiful day yesterday for the women's brunch. We thank you for all the good conversations that we had. We pray for all the newcomers, new students, that, will, that they will settle well and feel welcome in Broadmead. We put the hospitality month in your hands. Father, we pray that people will come to know each other wilder and deeper through these activities. We continue to pray for the crisis in the Middle East as situations has escalated. Lord, may you intervene and bring peace to the region. We lift up to you, Dan, as he, is having, he has his baptism today. We thank you that he is willing to confess and confirm his faith publicly. We pray that we pray for your, uh, we ask for your blessings and protection for him uh, for his journey ahead as he goes on his mission trip to Baboa, New Guinea. And Father, we also pray that um, uh, we pray for the message today. Lord, please speak to us through Steve, may we have a better understanding of the things happening around us through the Bible of Revelation. And Lord, please encourage and strengthen us with your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's say the last prayer. We're now going to have our reading, which this morning is uh, starting in Revelation chapter 21. So there'll be some pew Bibles around, um, or it will be all up on the screen behind me as well. Um, So do follow along, whether it's on on your phone or uh, in a Bible or on the screen above me. That's Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, 
Come, I will show you the bride, the way, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honour of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not be the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. I'll pray for Steve now as he comes to share the message of God's word with us. Lord God, we thank you that your word is living and active. We thank you that it it speaks to us and that um, it is you and and your word that transforms um, and that changes us. And we just pray for for Steve now as he brings this message. Father, will we have ears to hear? Will you be shaping our hearts so we can listen well? Help him to share um, the truth from your word. Lord, we pray us in your name. Amen. Morning, morning everyone. And um, do have a Bible open if you can. And we're looking, it's very simple, at the last three pages. Um, How about that? I want you to imagine your all-time favorite holiday destination, or or if that's too difficult, just the favorite, your favorite place that you've ever been, that you've ever lived. Uh, It could be anywhere. Are you thinking of it? Picture it in your mind. Might be a British beach, like the one that's about to appear, hopefully. Muselate, my favorite beach in the Gower. Fantastic, great. Surfing beach, Dan might be interested in that. Um, I love this beach so much that I even have it on a t-shirt. Or further afield, I think my choice might be somewhere like this, the majestic Victoria Falls in the heart of Africa. It's the place where I have felt most overwhelmed by the, the power and glory of creation. 
uh, the, the, the vast river thundering over the falls, surrounded by the rainforest, the trees teeming with wildlife. Um, it's an astonishing place. May, or maybe for you, it's a city like Barcelona with its classic buildings, its bustling life. Could even be that your favorite place is right here in Bristol. After all, our city is about the most popular place to live in the whole UK, where the balloons are always flying, the sun is always shining, and people are always having merry picnics on the downs. <laughs> but let's be honest, any of these places has its downside. Flight delays to your holiday, sunburn, uh, getting bored, getting ill, growing old, getting mugged, running out of money. There is always a reason to leave those places and come home or to go somewhere else. Nowhere on earth is perfect. So now just imagine your favorite location with none of those problems. A place where you would, you would never get bored however long you stayed. Uh, a place where there was no crime and no one was ever ill. A place where you never had to come home. And even if you stayed there for a whole lifetime, you would never get old. You can just remain there forever and it keeps getting better and better. Can you imagine your favorite place like that? It's ridiculous, isn't it? A crazy daydream. No. No. It is not crazy at all, and it is not a daydream. Because if we are with Jesus, you and I, that place is exactly where we are going. A place more perfectly peaceful even than Muslade Beach in the Gower, more majestic and overwhelming than Victoria Falls, and, and yet more vibrantly alive and full of people than Barcelona or even Central in Hong Kong. That's quite a place. And more home than good old Bristol or wherever home is for you. All of those at the same time. And best of all, the company of the one who loves us to infinity. Can you imagine? It's true. It's real. So today we conclude this mini-series in the book of Revelation. And today we arrive at the ultimate destination. So let's look at this slide again that shows where we've been. Well, we haven't been to all those places, but we've been to some of them. Um, and uh, show us where we've, where we've got to now. Last week we looked at chapter 13, right in the middle, where Satan unleashes his two beasts out into the world to do his dirty work and to attack and try to destroy uh, God's church, God's people. And we were encouraged to know our enemy and to stand firm to the end. The Lord Jesus has won the victory and we can be part of it. And then more dramatic visions follow on. Chapters 17 and, and 18, uh, you might like to, to glance at this with me in your Bibles, show us a vision of something called Babylon. And yes, again, I recognize that if, you're, if this is new to you, then this does look weird and bizarre, but I hope it will make sense to you even so, because this is so important and so wonderful. Chapter 17, Babylon is portrayed as, as a woman, as the great prostitute, the, the harlot. Um, and then in chapter 18, Babylon is portrayed as a great city that enslaves the world's people. Babylon the Great, which stands for rebellious humanity, for mankind shaking our fists in God's face. Babylon, a corrupt and evil woman. Babylon, a corrupt and evil city. That's the picture. And because this is going to be important for us today, let's see how chapter 17 begins, the first three verses. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. 
Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, covered with blasphemous names, and had seven heads and ten horns. That's the invitation to come and look. Not surprisingly, you see, this woman is closely tied up with the beast we met last week, the agent of Satan. Uh, But each of these chapters, 17 and 18, ends with Babylon fallen and destroyed. The woman torn to pieces, the city burned to the ground. And those scenes lead on to judgment as we arrive at the end of the age. In chapter 19, we see the Lord Jesus returning in power and glory to the earth to destroy his enemies. And in chapter 20, we see every man and woman gathered before the great white throne to be judged. The dead are raised to life to face that judgment. And every one of us is standing there. No exceptions. Everyone who has ever lived. The books are opened. The track record of every one of us is examined. And on the face of that, on the face of that evidence, every one of us would be condemned, condemned eternally. But there is another book too, and that is open. And this book is the book of life. The names of everyone who belonged to the Lord Jesus, who has loved him and trusted him, whose name is written in the book. Your name, my name, if we know him. And so evil is banished. And if our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, we are invited in to a glorious eternity. That eternal home is what we're going to see this morning. It's been pointed out that the Bible contains 1,185 chapters. And out of all of those chapters... Only the first two and the last two do not involve sin. And those last two chapters are what we're looking at today. The world was created perfect. Today we see a a new world where perfection is restored. In fact, if it makes sense, perfection is better. It's more complete than it ever was before. So let's take a look together as we, we pick out the highlights from chapter 21 and 22. This is an overview. The first point to notice, this place is not heaven. Look again at the first couple of verses of chapter 21. I won't read them. But Revelation includes plenty of glimpses into heaven. And if you are in Christ, and if you die right now, you will go to heaven, and you will join that glorious crowd around the throne, which we read about in Revelation 7, and you will enjoy the presence of God. But heaven is not forever. Heaven is great, but it's not the end. If I can put it like this, heaven is a waiting room for eternity. It's a much better waiting room than your dentist's waiting room. (laughs) but it's a waiting room for eternity. This is our final destination, the new heavens and the new earth. Compared to heaven, as we're about to see, this place is better, it's permanent, it's solid, it's full of vibrant community, and we will live there in resurrection bodies that will never grow old, never get sick, and never die. Chapter 20 talks about the resurrection of everyone into resurrection bodies. And that's how we will be in eternity. This is what happens after that. This place is even better than heaven. Next point, this place is the exact opposite of Babylon, which which has been judged and condemned. Back in chapter 17 and 18, we we see that, that woman and city called Babylon. And we see it judged and destroyed. Now listen to how the new creation is introduced in verses 9 and 10 here. Chapter 21, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. 
And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. If you listen carefully to chapter 17, you, you will recognize that that is an exact parallel to the way that Babylon is introduced there. And that's deliberate. Because these two are opposites. The woman and the city that is Babylon and the woman and the city who are the new Jerusalem and the bride of Christ. Satan has been building his great city and meanwhile God has been preparing his eternal city for us, our eternal home. Babylon has fallen, the heavenly city endures forever and the new Jerusalem is everything that Babylon is not. For a start, the heavenly city is astonishingly beautiful. Verse 2 again. She's like a beautiful bride, beautifully dressed. Again, the opposite of the, the scarlet woman, Babylon. Three weeks ago, my daughter Anna was married. And as I first saw her in her wedding dress on that day, we were in the house uh, getting ready there with the, with the bridesmaids before we went to church. And I first saw her in her wedding dress and I thought, and I'm not biased at all, by the way, I thought this is one of the most beautiful sights I have ever seen. And uh, some of you are friends of my other daughter, so for the record, yes, I thought the same on her wedding day too. Okay, just in case you're reporting back, <laughs> because some of you do. And this stunning bride is us, my friends. And that the bridegroom, the bridegroom is the Lord Jesus, and he is looking at us and he is saying, You are beautiful. You are beautiful. That's what he really thinks of us. The eternal city, the, the glorious bride. The beauty continues. 21 verse 11. It, it shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. And the, and the description rolls on verse after verse. And jo John is kind of grabbing every bit of extreme glory, beauty, language that he can. He, he's groping for words. The city is solid. It, 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 it's far removed from any notion of floating around on clouds, doing nothing. Glance through what John tells us from verse 12 onwards. He describes a great wall around the city with multiple gates and great foundations, all inscribed with the names of the founders of God's people, Old and New Testaments. See, in verse 16, the city has a shape and dimensions that can be measured. It has a definite size, building materials of jewels and gold. Now, some of this, no doubt, is symbolic. The language is symbolic. But the clear impression is that this city is, is, very, is very real and very solid and very large and extraordinarily beautiful. And actually, there's something very intriguing about these dimensions. Verse 16. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The shape of the city is given as a cube, and each side of the cube is 12,000 stadia long, 1,500 miles or so. It is big. And, and the mathematically inclined among you will immediately note that that means the total length of all the sides is 144,000. A number that represents the full number of God's people. Again, that was back in chapter 7. The message, we will all be there, all of God's people will be there in the city if we belong to him. But there's something else about this cube shape. And this takes us to the best thing of all. In the whole of Scripture, there is only one other object that is described as a perfect cube in shape. Like this one, it was covered in gold. Do you remember? 
the most holy place, the holy of holies at the very heart of the temple, that unique room where God dwelt among his people and where just once a year the high priest was allowed to go in and and meet with God carrying the blood of sacrifice and where no one else ever set foot. The most holy place is the presence of God among his people. And now that one small room expands to the size of a giant city. And it too is covered with gold and it is the dwelling place of God. And we are all in there with him. No wonder we get this in verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. No, you would look in vain for a temple because when God is everywhere and fellowship with him is perfect, you don't need a temple. He is it. This is the ultimate fulfillment of those Old Testament constructions, the tabernacle and the temple. It was all pointing to this. And so what will it be like living there with him? Jump back to verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Pause and dwell on those verses for a moment. The negatives first. The horrible things that won't be there. Death, mourning, crying, pain, the cancer diagnosis, the arthritis, the bereavement, the awfulness, the grimness of this life. We soon become familiar with all of those here on earth, but they will no longer be part of our experience. Have you been mourning someone? Do you know about living with pain, heartache? If you don't know it yet, you will. As long as we live in this world. But none of those will be there. Because of the one great and glorious positive. Because of the one who will be there. Our Lord and our God living among us. What was never possible before because of our sin becomes wonderfully possible and wonderfully real. That's a quick survey. The angel gave John a much better one than that. But we are not there to enjoy this yet. So what does this mean for us here and now? As we contemplate these closing chapters of Revelation, we're being called to do two things. First, simply, we are called to long for the destination. I mean, don't we long for this? And and, and so we need to make sure, uh, by the way, we're on the next slide, I think, Eddie. Um, Yeah, the one after that. No, the one after that. (laughs) Thanks. Um, We need to make sure we're actually there. There is no sin in the story of these two chapters, true, but in each chapter there is a brief reminder that not everyone will be in this city, far from it in fact. Because if we we do not know Jesus Christ, if our name is, is not in the book of life, then we are not in this picture. If that's you, your your destination is not the eternal city. It is outside. It is excluded forever. And so if if you're not a Christian, maybe you're, you're new to this. Maybe you're not used to church. Maybe you're not used to the Bible. Okay, but please hear this. Make sure that this beautiful city is where you're going. Make your peace with God through Jesus Christ so that you too can be part of this wonderful eternity. What baptism acted out with Dan just now is 
the meaning of that is that Jesus died and, and to forgive us our sins, to, to offer us new life, a new life just like coming up out of the water, just like coming out to a resurrection. That's the life that he offers us. And we all need that and we can all have that. Make sure that is you so that this future will be yours too. We'd love to help you come into that relationship with God. We'd love to talk to you about that if you don't know him yet. So, who is this city for in Revelation language? Look at verses 6 and 7. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. This city is for the victorious. Remember the overarching theme of this book, Jesus wins and we win with him. The victorious, the overcomer, that, that word that appears at, at, in each of the, the seven letters, um, the, the letter to the seven churches at the start of the book. Remember, we looked at that two weeks ago. And each of those letters ends with a special promise, a picture of life in the heavenly city. For the one who makes it through to the end. And if we know him, we will and we do make it through to the end. And we will be victorious because he has already won the battle. The book of Revelation contains a number of blessings scattered through its pages. Would you like to guess how many blessings? There are seven, right. And the ultimate blessing, number seven, which all the others point to, is here in 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Washing your robes, again, sounds weird, but it means being forgiven, made clean through the blood of Jesus who died for us. And the ultimate blessing there could be is access to the heavenly city, to go in through the gates and join in its life. What will that life be like? Just look again, verses 23 to 26 of chapter 21, the end of that chapter. It's a picture of movement. It's a picture of activity, of creativity. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. It seems the best of human life in this age, will reappear in the eternal city. It will be purified and redeemed and made perfect so that it can be offered back to God who gave it in the first place. Art, literature, music, creativity, discovery. What was done for the glory of God will be seen in eternity, perfected as we will be perfected, to be enjoyed forever. And no doubt we will add to it year by year by passing century. This is not going to be some dull, flat, monotonous existence. This is going to be life, life to the full. Don't we long for this? And in this city we will live perfectly forever. Look at the opening of chapter 22 again. So many biblical themes and plots reappearing and coming to fruition. We're back in the Garden of Eden where it all started with the tree of life. What Adam and Eve lost through their sin, we get back. We will have, but it's not just one tree, it's a whole avenue of the tree of life with this water of life flowing through the middle, the great street in the city, clearer and fresher than any stream on earth. And the curse of sin and banishment is reversed. Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden. We are welcomed in by God's open arms. Don't you long for this? And we will see his face. Simply not possible before this. There's no way that sinners like us can look on the face of a holy God and live. But we won't be sinners anymore. Perfect fellowship with God's. Do you notice what the Lord Jesus is called all through this section? 
This is eternity we're looking at, and still he is referred to as the Lamb. But the Lamb speaks of his sacrifice for us. And yes, that's how we will still know him. A million years from now, surrounded by glory and beauty, we can't begin to imagine the Lamb slain for us. For us, Jesus Christ will always be the Lamb who was slain, whose blood was poured out for us because he is the only reason we will be there. Not because of any good in us, but only because of him. And in place of the conflicts we know so well in our world, now there will be healing, the healing of the nations. What a vision. Every conflict ended. What a world it will be. Don't we long for this? Brothers and sisters, let's pray that the Lord will make this real to us. Because this is the true reality. Our promise, our blessing, our destination, a living eternity with the Lord, with the Lamb. Long for the destination. And secondly, listen to the summons. As we move on through chapter 22 and the, the visions come to an end and John kind of wakes up from what he's been seeing. We hear the words of the Lord Jesus himself. He's given John those visions to pass on to the churches, to pass on to us. But they're not just for our interest and amusement. They're not even just for us to look forward to. No, we still have a job to do. We're still here. And in the closing verses of the book, we hear this, this threefold summons from the Lord. He calls us to believe and to expect and to invite. There's a call to believe. Chapter 22, verse 7. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in the scroll. This, in fact, is, is blessing number six. A, a blessing for those who believe and obey this book. Coupled with the warning in the final paragraph not to subtract anything from it, not to add anything to it. This book of Revelation is the word of God, every bit as much as the rest of the Bible. We shouldn't miss that. However weird Revelation sometimes seems to us, however people have uh, made it say crazy things, this is the word of God. Think back, if you've been here over the last few weeks, what has the Lord been saying to you? Perhaps he's shown you himself more clearly than before. But the Lord Jesus, our Savior, the Lamb and the conquering King, perhaps he's helped you to love him more. But perhaps he's assured you that with him you are on the winning side so that you know you can keep going. This book teaches us so much about God and Christ and the cosmic battle that is raging and our place in it and what we're called to do. So are we going to believe it so that we can live it? Are we going to obey it? Because there is a blessing if we do. What does that obedience look like? Well, Peter gives us some help here at the end of his second letter. Um, up on the screen, look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 11 to 14. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. We're looking forward. Yes, he says that. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, yes, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, is it three times? Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Obeying this revelation about the new heavens and the new earth means being ready for it by living a holy and blameless life. A call to believe, a call to expect. We can't miss this. Throughout the closing section, three times the Lord Jesus himself says to us, I am coming soon. And when he does, this age of the world will end. And after that, judgment and eternity. The book started with this back in chapter 1, verse 7, as, uh, as we saw in our, in our first week. 
Look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, those who killed him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. The Lord Jesus is coming back. What a day that will be. Everyone, everyone will see him coming. Those who love him and those who hate him. Those who are ready for his coming and those who are not ready. Everyone will see the Lord Jesus coming with the clouds of heaven. The Lord is returning. How little we think of this in our cozy Christianity of today. The Lord is returning. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. We don't know. But we're called to expect and we're called to be ready. The Lord's return. I tell you, if you're persecuted, if you're in the persecuted church, you love this. This is your lifeline. Because this world is so gruesome and hard for the persecuted. They love this truth. The Lord Jesus is coming to rescue us. What does it mean for us here? And the final summons, a call to invite. Chapter 2, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Here is the picture. The Holy Spirit and the bride, the glorified church, are inviting people in. And then the people who hear that invitation pass it on. Come and enjoy the free gift of the water of life. Remember the picture of the river at the start of chapter 22? Remember Jesus saying to the woman at the well, I can give you a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is the invitation, and we are the ones who are to give it. So how are we giving this invitation? How are we inviting people to come to add to the number who have the right to the tree of life and go through the gates to join us in the eternal city? We're God's people, the people of the Lamb. We are safe, we are secure, and we know where we're going. But that is never a reason to sit, smug, to sit smugly and watch while the world and its people go to ruin. Like John on the island of Patmos, once the visions are over, we have an invitation to give. Come and take the water of life. Call to believe, a call to expect. A call to invite. And we'll finish, and we'll finish this mini-series with some famous closing words from C.S. Lewis's book, The Last Battle. As eternity begins, Aslan, the great lion, has been speaking. He says to the children, the dream is ended. This is the morning. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. We're going to sing in a moment, but just before you do, I want you to make you aware that Steve has written a book on Revelation, and if you found um, these last couple of weeks to be a real blessing, as I have, then they are over there. Um, if you'd like to pick one up, they're £10, um, and you can pay, just give a £10 donation to the church, just pick up the book, £10 donation, um, and we're going we're gonna to sing now um, in response to what we've heard. And yeah, do do please stand. Um, yeah, we're going to sing, and, and the words of our next song, "Where Where a Grave Is Your Victory," we're going to be, um, yeah, just looking forward to to eternity. The, the words of the chorus say, "Eternity is one for me by heaven's eternal King."
yeah, we'll just reflect on, on what we've heard from that sermon. And if you would like to, to pray with someone, there will be um, a team who are sat in the kind of back corner. So if there's anything you'd like um, to bring in prayer, we'd really encourage you to do that. So let's sing. service has gone on a little bit longer because of our baptism today if you do need to uh, head off you're more than welcome to we're going to sing one last song uh, amazing grace but you know if you've got something to get to obviously uh, do head out but if you can stay please um, sing this final song with us amazing grace
As we finish, I'll, I'll read those words um, from Revelation 22. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Amen. Do take your seats. Thank you so much for joining us here uh, this morning. Um, and, and Dan mentioned me, to me before the service, um, his family have brought some cake and various bits um, that will be in the hall afterwards. So do please stick around and yeah, we'll continue that time of celebrating together. Thank you so much for joining us and we pray that you'll have a blessed rest of your week.